Welcome everyone to the 12th annual Winter Solstice Poetry Reading. So I did this last year and I did not introduce myself. Hello, my name is Matt. Um, really excited to be here. Um, worked closely with Ed Davis to make sure that this continues and that this tradition uh, remains strong because I think this is a lot of value for the Yellow Springs community and, and beyond because I'm not even from Yellow Springs. Um, so just really excited to be here. 12 years means a lot. A few housekeeping items. There's an exit. That's the way out, right? If you go out and then you turn right, there are some restrooms. Other than that, there will be an intermission and we'll have some cheese and some snacks and some meringues that if you do not eat the meringues, I will take them home. I'm just throwing it out there, letting you know. Um, I wanted to let everyone know we are still celebrating the 10th anniversary of our poetry reading with this anthology right here. It is for sale out front. If you have not purchased a copy, We'd be very grateful that you did. Yeah. I have notes that I'm following to keep the show rolling in a meaningful way. Okay. A few thank yous. Um, this is probably the most important part. Thank you very much to the Tecumseh Land Trust, especially to the Tecumseh Land Trust Educa Education Committee, which I am a part of. Um, Ed Davis, and you are out there. Thank you so much. Um, couldn't have done that. This is, this is a group effort. There's a lot that goes into this. Also, thank you to Glenn Helen. Um, you're a large part of this. In addition to that, I would like to thank Melissa Bautista, who created this wonderful program. If you don't have one, they're out there. You can grab it. Last but not least, the media was our friend. And the Yellow Springs News is here. And Channel 5 is here. And you may or may not have read some advertisements in the Dayton Daily News. So super grateful for all of the word that was being spread around about our little event. I noticed that there are humans sitting in the back. I hope that you're standing in the back. I know some of you, but if you'd like to, there's more than enough room up here um, to sit down. It'll make it more fun as we go forward. Um, the next thing that I want to do is talk a little bit about why we're here. I'm going to welcome up Ashley, who is the new development director for Glen Helen. And we're just going to talk a little bit about what we're doing here and how we work together. So first, I'm going to say a few words about Tecumseh Land Trust, and then I'm going to pass it over to Ashley. And I did this because in the past, I attended this event, and I didn't always know, hey, what does Tecumseh Land Trust do? And, oh well, gosh, I know a whole bunch about it now because I'm actually on the board of trustees, and I absolutely adore this organization. And the main goal of the Tecumseh Land Trust is to help landowners protect their farms basically forever by providing them with conservation or by working with them to create conservation easements. And the conservation easement is an agreement that we enter into with the landowner that keeps the farm a farm forever, which is so important in so many different ways. Um, I'm, I'm going to stop there. I don't want to digress too far. But effectively, we can ensure food security. We can curb development. We can maintain our beautiful vistas. Um, we also help landowners with funding of, of restoration products or projects. And I have an image to show you. This is a farm that we have helped to preserve forever and ever. And it will remain a farm and it will produce food for us. Hooray! Thank you. In addition to that, this is a wetland, a wetland that is being restored in conjunction with HG Ohio. It is in Clark County. This is the way that it should have been forever. Right, but it wasn't like that, and now it's it's being converted back. It's significantly different than this now. There is water that has taken hold, and it's 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 being restored. So really excited to talk a little bit about that. I'm going to pass the mic over to Ashley, and she can tell you a little bit about Glen Helen. Thank Hello and welcome to the Glen. We are so excited to be partnering with the Tecumseh Land Trust tonight for an evening of poetry. And I do want to say that Glen Helen and the Land Trust, we are partners in more than poems. <laughs> the Land Trust holds the easement of the Glen, which means that we're partners in conservation. And we are so grateful for the collaboration that allows us to be the Glen forever and ever. Uh, Glen Helen, welcome here. We offer trails that you can go and visit. You can see our famous beaver dam and our family of beavers, if you're lucky. 
We also have a raptor center where we rescue and rehabilitate birds of prey. We have an outdoor education center where we would welcome your children or your grandchildren or your neighbor's children to learn about conservation so that this can go on for generation after generation. So we're glad you're all here tonight. We hope you enjoy the poetry and we hope you come back to check out our trail soon. Okay, thank you so much. All right, now, there's going to be a couple options. We are going to have 10 scheduled readers. They're going to come up. They've got about five minutes each. In between each one, I will give a little bit of a brief intro, but for the sake of moving forward, you'll find the biographies of the readers in the program itself, okay? No, 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 no. This is probably an important piece that I did not mention. If you would like to donate to either of our organizations, you can do so through this QR code. I'll leave it up there while I speak for another moment. So we have 10 scheduled readers. I'm really impressed with the diversity of the readers that we have tonight. Um, yeah, this should be a really good time. So without further ado, in alphabetical order, I'm going to begin with Ellen Austin Lee, our first reader. <laughs> Oh, there you go. I'm Ellen Austin Lee. And I hope you can hear me okay. All right, great, 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 great. I brought my phone up here um, so I could time myself, make sure I don't go over. So I'm going to start with a poem. Um, I'm from New York State originally. So I'm going to start with a poem um, that kind of describes my, my love of the woods. Adirondack Forest. Balsam. I enter the understory. Tiny pine needles soften the path. Muffled solitary footfalls. Golden sunlight dapples the canopy. Sky peaks bright blue. Branches rustle in a wave. A percussive brush accompanies the hollow drum of a woodpecker. The lone flute of a distant wood thrush. The forest floor swaying with vibrant green fans. Moss climbs granite boulders, decaying trunks. Emerald drapes fleece. The green I remember overgrowing my childhood home. Alone, always alone. I walked out onto the flat garage roof from the door off my bedroom. Half sat on a wrought iron railing near the angled slope, eye level with the leafy crown of a linden. I spent hours imagining I lived in the castles of my stories, the muted gray and rose slate made ancient by patches of moss. My dreamscape, these woods, too beautiful to be of this world. A visitor to this magical place, I won't disturb the fronds of lacy ferns. Instead, I gather a bouquet of remembrance, the verdant mystery fixed inside my mind. Oh, that's okay. Thank you. Thank you, though. Um, now I'm moving to Ohio, and um, this um, poem was in Gary, Carrie Gunter Seymour's I Thought I Heard a Cardinal Sing. So um, <laughs> some of you may have already heard this, but Ohio song. I pressed my head against the plane window as we passed Boston's Custom House Tower. My last few clock hands at a standstill. I flew to Ohio followed my love far, though back then he wasn't certain he wanted me. This frontier he had no interest entering. To me, ensconced in the Northeast, Ohio seemed a foreign land. But I was carried to Ohio against the jet stream. Unmarried, time for a child nearly expired, I stood suspended on the bridge over the old Ohio, the Queen City on one side, Kentucky on the other, where the North meets the South, where slaves swam to freedom, where the steamboat's tall stacks 
replaced the tall ships in Boston Harbor, clam bakes traded for barbecue. Cue the suns, because where your babies are born becomes home. And I sensed the stirrings of my first one a few months after I'd moved. I swung in Burnett Woods like a little girl when I learned the news. Hands gripping the chain link, legs pumping, eyes fixed on the sky. So high. Yes, I was. Airborne. I swear I was carried above Ohio, hung up on this dream. Thank you. I'm going to um, end with um, one more place, um, Ireland. I saved for my last um, big trip. Um, hopefully I'll go back, but I did it in 2019. So this is a short poem. It's a Welsh uh, form called a Clagernach. I don't know if I'm pronouncing it correctly, but um, it's called Horaeth, another Welsh word for homesickness, but for a place that you've really never been to, so a longing. So um, I wrote it after being in a ring fort in Ireland, where um, my ancestors came from Ireland and left um, during the Irish potato famine in the 1860s. So it was a traumatic departure. So it was like a homecoming. So Clagernach, Horea. Um, the epigraph is from Ethan Boland. What they survived, we could not even live. The hunger circles in echo, ring forts. I have wandered, I know. The rain birthing green, this island between standing stones, the ghost home. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ellen. I enter the understory. It's that first one, I know it was about New York, but if many of us remember the, the pine forest here, what it once was, and then you walked into it in the understories. It's an, an intense experience. So thank you so much for that reading. Um, next up, we'll be Bell. Hi, everybody. I'm Winnie Bell. I'm really glad to be here. Uh, when I was a kid, Yellow Springs was like this really cool place, like where all the cool people, like the spiritual people live. And I didn't think I was cool enough, you know, to uh, hang out. So I was always really tentative when I came. So uh, when Matt uh, emailed me to uh, invite me to read, I was like, uh, he probably emailed me by mistake, but I'm just going to say yes. <laughs> so, and then uh, my name's on the list. So here I am. Uh, I just started teaching. I wasn't sure that I was going to love teaching, but I do. One of my students in his final exam, he uh, kind of roasted me, um, which was really funny and really fun. Uh, but he called me middle aged, you know, and uh, I was like, oh my gosh, it's so funny that he's calling me middle aged. And then I did this little number math in my head, and I was like, oh my gosh, I'm middle aged. <laughs> So uh, anyways, I am going to read to you from a book that I published in 2017. It's called High Street of the Indigo Dream. And uh, I emailed Dr. Herbert Woodward Barton. I interviewed him for the Dayton City paper. Um, I don't know if some of you know him. He's like a Dayton, Dayton legendary poet. But it was right after this book came out and he told me that he burned all of his juvenilia. <laughs> like all of the work that he wrote when he was young, you know? And so sometimes when I look at this book, I think, oh, yeah, I could have burned that one, maybe. <laughs> but um, anyways, uh, this is one that I found that is a jewel to me, and it's called Coast to Coast Magic. This part started with the breath. I woke up under the blue bedspread. Bob Marley's Legend CD spun through a loft of Nog Champa. My brother sat in my office chair, juggling magic sparkles a silver spiral glitter wave. He sounded wild-eyed, wild-eyed, as if he were having an epiphany, and smiled. The greatest wisdom, he moved his hands, forming an eight, is in the greatest works. 
When he cupped the infinity sign, four white doves opened abruptly into flight like harmonious jet planes. They flew together in a circle to each corner where the walls met the ceiling, then toward the window. I startled awake. White wings fluttered against my neck and cheek, frantic beholding a glimpse of the last dove diving into the 11 o'clock sun. In my dream journal, I scribbled, I think he meant books. Anyway. Um, so I ran into another writing friend not too long ago, and he asked me what I was writing. We do that sometimes. You know, hey, what, are you, what are you working on? And uh, I was in this uh, writer's block because the last thing I had written was a eulogy. And it uh, lasted for a while, this writer's block. And I've never been into a time in my life where I couldn't write. So I was pretty scared about it, but the grief was just too thick. But anyways, it kind of got me thinking about, you know, the end of life when you're supposed to make plans and what do funerals look like. And uh, and this was one of the first uh, poems that came out of, of that after I got out of writer's block. It's called, On the event of my death, please have a service in the woods in autumn. On the event of my death, please have a service in the woods in autumn, next to the Stillwater River, the village of my ancestors. At the waterfall from the creek behind High Street, I will meet you there. Maybe you could sing Let There Be Peace on Earth from the Methodist hymnal or Give Peace a Chance by John Lennon, the a cappella version from the Blueberry Patch Artist Colony. I will be here and not here. I will be hugging my brother and laughing until we cackle, making big plans to travel. I will be dancing with my dad to Sinatra in the old new room, the house beside the woods, before he stops by heaven to play cards with Uncle Bill. Maybe my dad will recite goofy poetry. I will be cuddling in the arms of my grandmother. She will encourage my chakra healing, ancestral trauma, generational lessons, spirit, and energy writing and dreaming. She will wrap me in the light of the amethyst and say, you did your best moon child, and I'm proud of your progress. I will be with you, but not with you. I will be seeing soprano and harmonizing with my favorite ladies in their own astral dream travels when and if they might miss me. I will be learning hieroglyphics in the pyramids of Egypt and touring the books of life in the most indescribably beautiful libraries. I will be studying the Akashic records, relearning what it means to be mine, sitting around the fire with my sisters, waking up in sweet banana fields in the islands, painting morning sunrises with my toes in the ocean above clusters of sailboats and dolphins. Maybe I'll go to Jupiter and sit on her rings, my feet hanging over the lead with my very best friends. We'll eat calorie-free tangy taffy and zebra cakes and sprees. We'll wash them down with clear water from the Crystal River while we ride white horses through Orion to the moon. Listen to Dave Matthews and old choir tapes from my father's homeland. I will be here and not here. You may not see me. But if and when your mind is quiet and you think of me fondly, I may swoop down and whisper in your left ear or visit you in your dreams. On the event of my death, please have a service in the woods in autumn next to the Stillwater River, the village of my ancestors. Spread the ashes from my earthly coat of colors into the waterfall from the creek behind High Street. Invite Pastor John and Pastor Latoya to do the eulogy. Maybe you could get Chaz and Rob Tyre to sing. I will meet you there, but not there. I will be flying with the dragonflies and free, studying the pure tur turquoise blue watercolor hearts of the trees. I will hug you from my spirit heart when you think of me. I will be with you, but not with you. I will be chanting among my sisters and grandmothers under the stars, around the fire, sand dancing with my girlfriends from Florida, high-fiving my brother and laughing until we cackle and singing into your dreams. Let them tell stories about Jesus, the creator, and the universe. Someone please tell the story of the resurrection. Maybe you could read out loud from Deepak's books about the wisdom traditions. But don't let anyone tell you or let you believe there is only one way to salvation. 
in the event of my death, maybe you all could gather in the woods of my childhood among the rainbow falling leaves and sing all the songs you've ever heard about peace. Thank you. Uh, I do want to remind everyone that there will be an open mic after the scheduled readers. I don't know where the sign up sheet is, but it's on an 11 by 17 somewhere out front. So we'll get to that when we get to intermission. Our next reader is your Chappelle. Um, in 2024, at the Herndon Gallery in the old uh, South Hall at Antioch, we are having a poetry fellowship there as well for people. Um, it's called Last Sundays at the Herndon, which will be at the Herndon Gallery. Um, it's good to see all these villagers, visitors, poets. I'm really humbly honored to be in this group. Um, wow. I heard something a few poems ago. Heard something of your poem so far, pretty much life changing. I should be taking notes. Um, this poem is for my friend, his name was John Sims, and he was my father, William Chappelle's favorite student. He made a senior project, which later became the AACW, which later became the Blues and Jazz Festival. That was his senior project. He passed away in January, and uh, this poem you may remember having been published in its entirety, honoring his. Uh, celebrated life and I'll, I'll try to be quick i'm sorry a birthday poem for john sims in spoken math art d equals distance from detroit to florida panhandle solve for d dob 214th dod 12 december 2022 how do we follow a falling star we think in math and speak in bars. March, one, two, left, right, walk, don't run, run, don't stop. Keep your eyes on the prize and your hand on the ball. Math on chalkboards, dressing for prom in spring. For old black men, one girl, one way, math. Pay attention. Space minus the structure of one black man plus molecules of brain matter over love times spirit equals infinity squared base two times 262 post COVID female body weight. This is a double variable equation to be balanced. That is, a variable on each side must be eliminated. Space, defined as the infinite, ever-expanding creation palette known, comprehended, and accessible only to one unparalleled sovereign and originating source, space, minus the structure of one, alone, lone professor of complete dissimilitude, one. Space minus the structure of one. Black man. Hey, yo, check dig. Don't you know math? You don't know math. I said, you don't know math. Yo, you don't know me. You don't know me like that. Minus one black man. Minus gray. Present. Minus Floyd. Present. Minus Aubrey. Present. Minus Tamir. Tamir. Here, here, here. Bracket. Man divided by two. Parentheses. H12 plus six. And parentheses equals 18. End bracket. Space math. Infinite, endless, expanding, reaching wide, open, space, minus, minus, lost, subtracted, taken away, absent, less one, removed, annihilated, erased, minus one, black man, the structure of one, black man, plus molecules of brain matter. You ever think about that? Think it through. Think fast. Think first. Think you trip and think long and hard. Think smarter. You better think. You better think about it. Think twice. Don't think twice about consequences, about possibilities. Think about what we did about time to use your mind. About time to use your mind. Think about your future. Calculated thought. Space minus the structure of one black man plus molecules of brain matter over love time spirit. Stop. Oh, that's big. Love over spirit. 
Love is free falling. One plus one is two. You mean your grown folks business. One plus one is one. God alone knows himself. Mind your business. One plus one is four. Two parents plus four children equals six lives. So one plus one is six. Let X equal six. Ain't nobody's business. Space minus the structure of one. Black man plus molecules of brain matter over love times spirit equals infinity squared. Squared, a number taken to the power of two. There is power in two. What I and I can do with me and you. Space minus the structure of one. Black man base two. This is a binary operation. Base two. Walking or falling. Black or white. Left or right. Right? Wrong. This or that. Do you see better in one or two? One or two? One. Do you see better in three or four? Three or four? Four. Okay. One or four? One or four? One. Definitely one. One. Definitively one. Minus one times 262. Post-COVID female body mass equals negative 262. That's me. Minus one black man times 365 days a year equals one. How long I personally hear the sigh of breath leading the body of a giant. Happy birthday to you. And twice. The next reader is not here with us this evening. Phoenix Fire, so hopefully she will be able to, to attend next year. So we're going to move right past that, and we would like to welcome Amanda Hayden. Hello, I'm following Felicia Chappelle is not intimidating at all. <laughs> so I had two poems picked out for this event that went with the theme. And then a few weeks ago, this other piece started coming down the chute. And um, pretty soon it kind of elbowed the other two out of the way. So this is fresh, fresh, fresh. And it is mostly about the American landscape, and a woman's body. It's called The United States of This Body, an American song. This body is rattle, snake skin shed to earth. This body is underground bunker, tent, and yurt. This body is tree trunk, roots, Thick branches stretched and perfectly filled with perfectly swirled nests. This body is sparrow and sinew, spleen and sanctuary, gamara and gospel, epistle and elegy. This body is tongue coated red, white, and blue, untied shoes. This body just wants to age with grace, becoming its own muse. This body is milk, let down cream, catfish mouth, and baby breath, proverb, psalm, love letter, and lament. This body is overpass, bridge, and tunnel, sunken ship, vixen vessel, billboards warning hell is real. This body is pox, virus, and compost covering. This body is regenerating as it is hibernating. This body is detour ahead under construction, covenant, sworn oath, independent declaration. This body is land of enchantment, prairie, and garden state, wheat, soybean, corn, and fingers tobacco stain. This body is daffodil and daisy, sunflower and magnolia, sequoia and sycamore, sweet gum and catalpa. This body is red-winged blackbird and cardinal, cactus blossom and waterfall. This body flies with her own wings, the heart of it all. 
This body is Red River, Rio Grande, and Shenandoah. Cracked pavement, dusty miles, and dirt roads. This body is maple syrup on tap, sugar shack. This body is coal dusted canary of this country's mine shaft. This body is broken treaties, broken vows, and broken teeth. This body is rushing waters, maps of tributaries. This body is shushed mouths, erased herstories. This body is trauma on trauma on trauma on repeat. This body is love my country, not my government. This body is on its knees, not for some man, but rising up a mother's pleas for her children to go to school each morning and come back alive. This body is sick of being mansplained, man lawed, and colonized. This body writhed and cried, scrapped, and survived. This body is tired of being told to smile when she don't feel like it. Days when it takes volcano strength to hide it, this body is folklore, fairy tale, urban legend, and fan fiction. Liberation, emancipation, natural rights, not just given. This body is broken systems, coins flipped into fountains, more valleys than mountains, more turquoise than gold, more shadow than smoke, more clay than sky, more funnel cake than apple pie. This body is pole boys and grits, cob salad, and deep dish. This body is Pueblo, holler and hill, bison, bear, elk, and eagle. This body is we the people. This body is Hindu, Muslim, Buddhist, Christian, Sikh, Jewish, Baha'i, and pagan, believer, sinner, seeker, wash clean, bhakti, devotee, image of divinity. This body is your body. This body is my body. This body is poetry slingshot into the void. This body is imbalanced scales, cradle, cradled in a borderless palm, whistling her wild and weary, centuries old American psalm. Thank you. I'm really glad that you chose that one. Next up is Nick Urquhart. Good evening, everybody. Thank you for having me. It's a, it's a pleasure. And um, <laughs> I know the prompt is very nature driven. Uh, but my grandmother died a few months ago. And so I kind of realized some of my poems were very much. Uh, about her and included her in a lot of ways. So I, I picked some of those and I'll donate a little extra to the line first. Uh, if you forgive <laughs> this poor indoor kid. <laughs> um, this one's called Naivity Scene. We were just two tangled strands of lights checking each dead bulb to see what would fix the blues. It's tradition. My grandmother still cries after the presents are open and it's been three years since he died. I think she expects something else. The kids are all grown, and it's just gift cards and socks. I didn't ask for this, but thank you so much. It's just what I needed. The first time my mother brought my father home for Christmas, he was five years younger than I am now. I can't picture him at that age, because he's on his knees, swearing at the angels in the tree about the lights not staying still. They're just pulsing, then racing, then flickering. You cried the whole night in bed. I said goodbye in the morning and closed the door behind you for the last time. I can't picture my father doing this. The lights go out sometimes and it isn't the strand. No amount of plugging and unplugging will help. You have to take from another to replace the day. Um, this is called Carpenter. With red eyes, she watched over him as he drift in and out of sleep or waking dream from the pain medication. His arms would lightly raise from the bed and float in midair before he'd begin his work. 
hammering, usually. His thin white hands gripping a handle he couldn't see, and silently tapping a nail into some invisible construction of his past. My grandmother laughing, despite herself. I've done it wrong, he'd say a minute later, his teeth missing. I want to start over. And he'd reach up with those thin arms to guide a plane across the wood he and only he could see. We'd take turns at the bedside holding his hands when they weren't at work and say our names. He'd turn his eyes to us and know that we were there. The medication switched to something stronger and we'd lose him even more to his work to whatever piece of furniture he was crafting, destroying, rebuilding, until that perfect, terrible moment of lucidity struck and he turned to my grandmother and begged, put a nail through my head, this is taking too long. Um, this is called Hearts. You played spades, but bored of it, and switched to hearts. Like how you could go it alone and not rely on a partner to deliver the right card at the right time. There was less baggage, a greater likelihood you could shoot the moon. At a party, someone explained to me how each time you shuffled a deck of cards, it is almost certainly the first time that arrangement of cards has ever been dealt. All these hands knew. So it's easy to get lost in the shuffle. Were hearts broken? No, not yet. Still the nervous play, unsure when the queen will appear, still holding on to what we have. What are the odds we'll ever have it again? So good again. This is called Jove. They're saying we owe our lives to the gas giant Jupiter, that it shields us from the collisions of city-sized debris hurtling through space. I asked my father about what the doctor had said, and he picked me up in his arms and asked me what I wanted for Christmas. Boom. Astronomers with pictures of an explosion shooting out of a storm's world surface. Like a vacuum, they said, sucking up all these rocks as it sweeps the distant dark of the solar system. Something had come in the mail one day, and I remember my father on the porch saloon with a beer in his hand as we sat down inside to watch TV. The rusted chains of the swing creaked forward, creaked back, forward and back. We called him to come in, but he was looking at something far down the street. I could see through the window that mosquitoes swarm around him in smaller and smaller circles. This is the last one. Dusk on a porch in West Virginia. There's a little more nature in this one. There you go. The day had been picking up steam and setting it on the crooked shelf of sky as gently sliding clouds. Now, at light's end, the moon has nestled itself in the small of the mountain top's back. Mist rises from the trees, and it is clear that both mountains are sighing, forest-blanketed lover lying next to lover. Inside the house, the sound of women talking, laughing, their voices too thick with twang to escape through the screen of the door. The chains of the porch swing creak with each forward, backward, forward, backward push. A rusted tra tractor with flat tires sits in the field across from the house, and tall weeds thread themselves through its cracked innards. They bow and bend slightly. Far away, something is breaking. The dogs ran up and down the holler in the last moments of twilight, pails at nervous attention. They trot back to the porch after realizing they've been barking at their own voices as they bound back down the valley walls. Thank you. Great, grateful for your interpretation, Mary. That first one was really important. I like that a lot. Uh, next up, Arden Isaac. Thank you, Matt. Hello, everybody. This is so sweet and so encouraging. Uh, thank you uh, to the poets and everyone. I'm grounded uh, by three things, and I have a poem for each. The first that grounds me is meditation, and this is a short poem called Intention. It's what I think as I sit to meditate. It has an epigraph by Juan Alvarez, Life is here now. Everything else is just thinking about life. Intention. Skating around the fragile edge where my state of presence slips with the context, believing everything I think. 
focused on proving my competence. Let me develop this practice of recalibrating my awareness to become the context, disfascinated from mental chatter, so that I can be present for others at the fragile edge. Hold your applause, please, till, till the end. Thank you very much. The, the second thing that grounds me is uh, non-human nature. And, uh, and tonight, our dog. The first of two poems about the dog, one's called uh, The Favor, and in, in this uh, poem, uh, the dog refers to me as Good Time. That's my name in the house, and that's my canine name is Good Time. Elisa's name is Food Lady. Uh, dog's name is Margo. She's home watching. Hi. Um, so this is called The Favor. You are sitting, staring, pecking at your desk. I am on the floor, stretching beside the ball. Let me do you a favor, good time. Come down here, good time. Throw this ball, and I will bring it back to you. I will give you purpose. I will return you to here and now. I will do you the favor of returning you to us. Sure, the dog gets applause. Okay, so the... Uh, <laughs> And then this one, uh, a couple years ago, uh, you know, a, a fatal storm came through a couple years ago. It was Memorial Day, if I recall, and uh, uh, and we were scared, and, and we ran to the basement. And this is a this is a story about that. It's called "Wake Up Now." I'm barking in the dark, splitting the night and your sleep, because I love you, because we are not safe here. I smell storm, a big one. I am barking, wake and comprehend. Let's get up now. We need a stronger shelter, somewhere safer. Forgive me for waking you with 10 minutes to spare. You could have slept a little longer. But now, the last moments of calm, there's time to go out front for a pee. Then in the basement, on that old couch, we will softly sing hymns and snuggle for safety and love. The third thing that uh, grounds me is resolution of, of relationships. And uh, towards that end, I, I wrote my ethical will in the form of a, a golden shovel. It's a form of poetry uh, that I have an explanation for out on the table. I'll spare you the explanation, except that it is a, a, Pablo, a, a line from Pablo Neruda is, is woven uh, down the right side of this. You'll see it if you get the handout later. It's called Ethical Will. The, the, the epigraph is from uh, the translation of a poem called A Dog Has Died by Pablo Neruda. There are no goodbyes for my dog who has died, and we don't now and never did lie to each other. Ethical will after Pablo Neruda. As planted in your mother's garden there, you seedlings of bean and sweet pea, are repotting yourselves what we know of you, children, so good. Today I step into summer, by scanning the gardens for Elisa in radishes and greens, my love and our lunch, the dog at her feet, content within this acre. Whoever is happy, desires life, has found where joy lives, longing has died. Now at 60, my fruits are smiles and words, my leaves are patience. I know we have shared love so long, we don't know it only from seeing it now. When infants, you slept on my chest, and aged, I will walk in your arms. Never wonder. You have been clear. I did know you loved me. May hearts supply the earth, the sun, the rain, to surround you, nourish you, each with love, grown at home with another. Thank you. All over the emotional spectrum there. I love it. I love it. All right. Next up, Solomio Ring. Is that all Ta da.
I have to say, I really admire these folks that can read from their telephone. Like, that really separates the generations, I think. Wow, I can barely even see that. Okay. First poem, I always write a solstice poem, and this is to 2023. And there was so much bad news this year, and so I wrote a very bitter one, which I threw out, and I have a tamer one for you this time. Not even bad news affects the turning of the earth. The clots of blood which soak the soil during the long dark night mean nothing to time's eternal clock. We are alone here on our little piece of rock. Pity us that we haven't yet understood that humble dimension as the cosmos unfolds timeless beyond us. Click, click, click. We creep closer to the sacred hour, avoiding the hungry ghosts of yesteryear, sweeping the dead from our thoughts. The moon rises brilliant and cold from its narrow bed, chasing the sun as this frightful year comes to its black end. At its nadir, we hope for the best. The return of warmth, the blessings of beauty, and maybe something else, a spirit to watch over us, a will to forget past enmities, a small blessing a place on this pitiless patch of dirt that doesn't end in tears, because all of us are already captive. And yet, if we can't live in our own history, grounded in stories past, who are we? Now, Matt made us uh, a theme, which is groundedness, uh, however you want to interpret that. So I wrote this ode to Ohio and dedicated it to Matt. <laughs> um, there is actually nothing more beautiful than an Ohio forest or field. The way the sun glints and waits at us, tremulous and low, the curves of the deep throated woman as she calls. The land of many ancestors, the history of Indians and their kin, their blue mounds glimmering with secrets. The white men who came after and then so many other immigrants too, all shades and sizes, feeding to Ohio earth like bones to skin. The various colors in the seasons of ecstasy, summer in their fulgent greens and yellows, the cerulean of the sky, the deep purple of the roots, the air sated with the promise of rain. And how could I not love the coming of solstice, the end of autumn turning to winter? The bare hillocks and slow moaning of the wind, the black earth, tunescent as it was for spring. Then finally spring, wildflowers and too many grasses, owls and hens and birds nesting all day long, they're flocking in the snow of berries, the days long into the gloaming. I love Ohio in all seasons, the smell and feel of it, as a child loves its mother without reason, remembering only the milk which flowed and fed it. Having grown up here at his home, undoubtedly a solstice present. Uh, continuing the theme of groundedness, which was our homework. Uh, this I wrote, uh, for my mother about, uh, China actually. And this is 
called A Mother's Lament, and this is to be thought of as my mother reading this poem. Born in 1925, I immigrated to this country when I was 24. It has been 65 summers now, my daughter, since I left my home in the mountains. Among the four clear streams, 65 winters that I have spent with the foreigners, eating cold cereal that makes me fart, and avoiding cheese and poison tomatoes. I am going home, my daughter. You have promised me in this, my 89th year, to take me back. My brother is waiting for me, and many relatives I do not know. Me shoots of rice that has sprouted up after I left. My father died while I was gone, already many years ago. I cried for him alone in my room, the whole sea between us. They wrote to me, telling that just before he died, he sat straight up in bed and called my name. They are waiting to welcome me back with banquets, the young girl who left so many years ago, her hair straight and black with two long braids, swinging with vigor. I walked with a firm step. My voice was full, and I could sing four octaves of true pitch. I barely said goodbye to my family, believing I would be back in just a few years. The winds blew me, the storms blinded me. I could not find my way home. I forgot the sweet, hot porridge of the mornings, the cool, clear air of night, my father chiding me to study harder. I forgot the lilt of the language, the spitting and the smoke, the tiny birds and bamboo cages, each with their own porcelain dish. The chili peppers numbing me like anesthetic. The icy flesh of the lychee. And the pages, the scholars' pages, turning from left to right. At 89, I walk bent over. My daughter guides me, helps me pack and set all the boxes straight, sealing the presents for each one, because I am too old for all that. She tells me to stand erect and pushes my shoulders down, the same advice I used to give her when she was a child. I look in the mirror and see that I am toothless and lipless, and when I laugh, the lipstick goes on my gums. My hair is white and sparse. Even to myself, I look ghostly, and I hear my father calling me kindly. Eat sweet guan, eat sweet jing. A minute of time is worth a pound of gold, but even a pound of gold won't buy you back a second. I remember singing all summer long in our courtyard at home, romantic songs waiting for my prince. Father told me a story about a frog who had a big mouth and croaked day and night instead of looking for food. At the end of summer, the frog died of hunger. That was my father's way of reproaching me. I always liked wasting time. Here in America, where things are so cheap and easy to get, I go about buying whatever I like. And if it's made in China, I feel so happy as if it had come straight from the hand of my father. Although I was not for real and did not go back, I remember him. How is it that I remember all these things from long ago? Those happy times that made me sad when I look back? Yet, when you tell me you are my daughter, my firstborn child, I am not even really sure it's true or what your name is. Come and hold my hand. Tell me that I am not shaking. Tell me again. Repeat to me. Promise that I will live so that you can take me back. Last year I wrote a poem about starlings. It was called Murmuration of Starlings. 
And that's that phenomena when at dusk, thousands and thousands of starlings rise up in the sky and uh, just do acrobatics, basically, while they're looking for a place to roost. And afterwards, someone came to me and told me where I could actually see starlings here in Ohio. So there's some fields nearby where if you want to watch them, you can. And so I wrote a poem, Let. It's really tiny. And I called it the susurration of starlings, as opposed to the murmuration. Ten thousand sighs rising simultaneously to the heavens, the wings breathing as one, tuned to the same frequency a murmuration of tiny hearts, a whole flock perviewing with needle pink precision, like black stars enveloping the roosting sky turning it into an acrobat, a floating witness. I should have I should have been like Artie and just said wait then we the end. But now we are at the end. So uh this is my very last poem. And this is a poem that's in response again to a Pablo and Aruda poem. And in this poem, Pablo Neruda says he only wants five things. Endless love, to see autumn, winter, and summer, and finally to have his lover's eyes always looking at him. So he only wants those five things, and then he'll be satisfied. So in response, I wrote a poem saying, these are the five things I will part with. One. I want to give you my legs, my short, stubby legs, so that you can try climbing up on the freezer in the grocery store to get the last ice cream on the top shelf. But also my legs that let you travel to the last nethers of the world to see the radiant waters where the heart streams emerge, to feel the auroras singing the earth awake. Legs that carry you far from the land of your birth, that let you explore to your heart's contentment and then carry you back home. Two, I want to give you my last scream, the scream that comes of hysteria when I enter the icy ocean, my breath suddenly frozen and my pubis hard as a rock, a scream of shrill ecstasy that dissolves into laughter. A scream that releases all the tension. A scream that resounds from the rocks of hell. Three. I want to give you endless love. So abundant it flows like water from a well, filled with the stars of the night. But wait. Endless love, yes, but not forever love. A love with a time limit of five minutes, like we're supposed to have now, so that you'll never take me for granted. Four, I want to give you the smell of fresh laundry, starch collars, clean underwear, the smell of musk and spice all washed in you, and the smell of autumn and spring and summer, Smoke and pumpkins, roses and bergamot, and humus and compost, and a good strong smell of manure. Five. And this is the last thing I want to give you. I want to give you words. Words that enrapture you. Like a soft cloth with a voice that can't be measured by a teaspoon or a cup. Like a pinch of salt but instead words that curl around you like your mother's love and give you your own violent place in the world. A voice that can't be measured. Next up is Vera Grace Manaki.
This is Menifee. <laughs> um, hi, everyone. My name is Vera Menifee. Um, it's, I'm so grateful to be here following and a part of this reading. Um, Stella, that was incredible. I really enjoyed hearing your poems. Um, and everyone else before has been amazing. Uh, I'm actually a college student at Oberlin. And so I drove down today to be able to come. And I'm really inspired by Lucille Clifton's poetry. And so I appreciate poems that have brevity and are short. So I'll be reading just a few short poems today. This one is called, Sometimes I Look Up at the Sky and Wish I Was a Cloud. Sometimes I look up at the sky and wish I was a cloud. Wish I did not break so easily. Wish I could release my lonely and hug my hips the way clouds do when they rain. Taking up space in a tiger eye horizon, unashamed and anew. How revolutionary it is to lift your heavy and become shades of air. Pulsing like wind, waving through blue, opening with bruised hues the way a leaf unfurls, longing to touch a star. Um, this next short one is called Dream of Appalachia, and I wrote it in dedication to Bell Hooks after she passed away. The morning that I heard, I walked through your garden, the one you planted with your pen, and pressed my toes in frozen soil, touched bare soles on chilled stone to shock my nerves out of disbelief. I wanted to stay in the ice cream for just a moment longer to remember when I could hold your hand and sit at your feet while you told me stories and braided flowering blue barrettes saved from spring through my hair. It was winter, so nothing was growing, but nothing was dying either, only dead. You were gone, I am dying, and now I don't know if the cone flowers will ever return. This one is called A High Boon for Walking on Water. When the world came to be too much, I found a path and the round of those backwoods where I could excavate loneliness and find myself. Alone in misty showers, my heart sank into a lull only hushed lily pads could bring to my chest. Droplets danced on my eyelashes, blurring what was in front of me, but somehow strengthening my step. I leaned into faith that day after being left in the rain. I danced along a path of broken twigs and missed turns. Mud painted the soles of my feet, and in rebellion of death, I released my chrysalis. I dipped my toes into your center, a still water overtaking my drought and sorrow. The wooden arms above me rustled back and forth in a wind carrying my ancestors' deepest desires as they spoke. Listen to the trees. This land is you. You are me, waiting to be free. I think I have time for one more poem shortly. Um, this one is called Mama's Garden, and I dedicated it to my mother and grandmothers because we will plant our garden one day. Mama's Garden has collard greens and kale, tomatoes and basil, Pinto beans and black-eyed peas, sugar cane to sprinkle in pots of peas, green beans and legumes to sprout life into rows of corn she will ground into grits. Mama's garden grew without fertilizer or cool washes from working hoses or an asthma-free breeze. Mama's garden grew through drought and eviction notices, grew even when plants were not there because Mama's garden lived in Mama which she carried inside of her to share what she sowed with the women who sang struggle into creation from notes, harmonies, stories they found in the soil to tell their daughters, our lives are a wasteland waiting for us to water. Thank you all. Severe Grace Menifee. Sorry that I botched that up. I hate it when someone mispronounces names. On that note, I'm extra guy, Ishmael Soldan.
So this first poem was written uh, in response to the theme that Matt gave us. Um, because when you think of the term grounded, typically the first thing that comes to mind is home and nature. But for those of us who are third culture kids, um, refugees, or from immigrant populations, home is a lot more complex. So um, this poem is called American Bedouin. You'll know that place of which I speak by the reverence it's given by those fleeing, the old playgrounds, first battlegrounds that now lie dead and silent as a shroud. The local patois neighbors used to speak, conquered by modernity, uprooted, upstaged, upsold, lifetimes brought low by the hours, covered by asphalt and new developments, that place you thought would never age is now a price you cannot fathom. You'll miss what you do not see, house to house, as cold, a cold that defies the sun. Every man, every neighbor for themselves, the ghost of community exercised. Beneath the silky gaze of decayed luminaries, a constellation of lonely souls, each a prisoner in their home, until they too are priced out. You'll know them by what they left behind, houses knocked down, yards grown wild. Traditions fading to the recent past, accents taken with them, word trails, new blood in old homes, their place temporary until they are gone, fates linked by federal routes, a nation on the run. Mm -hmm. and so this next poem is called Forever Nomad. Mm -hmm. You know not who I am, but what I seek in the dunes of memory, across the sea that flows inside stalky eternity, scanning for another verse in those illusory streams we hunt, surrounded by metaphor and refrain that taunt our never-ending thirst. An eternal nomad is what I've been called, while swaying toward the same mirage. Vanished are yesterday's chains, even while dust devils tempt me away. Stretching horizons promise springs, and I march toward them willingly. No pit of sand or waste can keep me from seeking your oases. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was outstanding. Our last reader is Myrna Stone. Just a reminder that following this, we will have a short reception with wine and cheese, and then we'll come back in for an open mic. Last but not least, Myrna. Hello, everybody. Um, it's really nice to be here with celebration of poetry and poets, so I'll be brief. Can you hear me? Ah, sorry, I'll be brief. <laughs> so that's okay. This is good. I have a soft voice, so it doesn't always translate. Thank you. Okay, thanks. I appreciate that. I actually tried to stick to the grounding, um, and I really didn't have to, but I. <laughs> Oh well. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to read three poems. First one is called Wild Onion. In botany, Allium stellatum of the family Liliacea, cousin to Trillium, Solomon seal, and bellwort, whose root, bulb, leaf, and stem are edible or medicinal, fodder for squirrel, elk, deer, poultice for boils, anodyne for fever, sting of bee and wasp. Amulets ward off dizziness or croup from the old French union and the Latin nuno meaning oneness. Organism of obfuscation and trumpery whose lavender blossoms deftly belie the flagrant acidic breath that draws us now step by step up from the river's bank to its grassy open bed. Siren of the olfactory, most evocative of the senses. Its leaves bristle and flare, summoning to each of us a summer kitchen, and in it a mother 
aprons and dewy weeping at her chopping block. But we are, after all, animal. And what seduces here in the shank of the day is vegetable, a booty we will dig for like dogs and take home for our supper a shill, a shindy, a caustic pearl. To Raxicum officinale, which is the Latin name for the common dandelion. Just a second. Early spring, the first light still vague, nacreous, glacial, and nothing of the season in the air but rain, the gray and lateral sweep of wings above the roof, a straw, a line drawn in spindle and spine. Nothing of the season in the mire of waste place and field, but the wildflower the French called Dompelon with the serrated edges of its basal leaves. In this light, this moment, this might be home, my mother alive again, in love with the turning of the year, down at her knees in the fields of the Ohio Valley to harvest the greens, alchemy of earth, wind, and water, a sort of sunlight on the tongue, the walk home somnolent, her work at the sink slow, the kitchen tap down doorway and window. The rain falls, now incremental, measurable across the vertical light, the endless pattern already begun in the parry of root and knife, and the leaves in a moment darken to bitterness, and the blow wall lousy on the wind lays desire or fidelity promise. And what remains in the hand, a tally of last time, is counted seed by seed, hour by hour. Thank you. I've been working the last three years on um, It's Ridiculous, uh, poems about Robert Frost, and how retro can we get? And who, can, and who cares, right? Except me, I'm absolutely obs I'm obsessed with him. I couldn't figure out why, why, why was he, why was he so obsessive? Well, he, first of all, he was a melancholiac, which I am too. So that's probably why I was interested in him. Um, depression is no fun, but you know, it's better than not being here at all. So this, <laughs> gotta look at the bright side. So this is, uh, this is a, a poem in that series on his life. It's called Robert Frost in Despair. The Great Dismal Swamp, and this is true, Virginia, North Carolina border, early November 1894. Does she or does she not love me? Will she or will she not mourn me? He recites, sore and beset, the phrase now counting down inside his brain like clockwork as he trudges ever deeper into the swamp. No lover or gear animates his sorry plight, save one, to purge Eleanor White's heart of all but the bitterest regret for minimizing him and his quintet of poems, bound in gilded leather, which he offered as proof to her of his newfound fitness to marry. Therefore, she must ready to bury him, if indeed his body be found in this abominable bog. All about are nettles, crossfire, and briars, and suicide, by rattlesnake or water moccasin, if he dare employ it. Yet, even as he presses on, his grit first wavers, then wanes, his clever botanizing eyes subverting his anger, and stirring a focus on the mucky flora that reveals at last the folly of his grand romantic gesture. In an hour, he shall be taken over by a band of duck hunters, rowdy and profane, packed in a ruddy skiff, who will forthwith carry him to solid ground and sanity. Thank you. So grateful for everyone's attendance. You're free.
Please don't forget to hang around for the open mic. Señoras, señoritas y caballeros, todos a bordo, por favor. Every time. Thank you, Dave. All right, as I was saying, really like a good crowd that hung around for open mic, which isn't always the case, so I really appreciate that. Right, Ed? Yeah, thumbs up. All right. Um, I'm going to kick it off. I'm going to read a poem. Uh, I haven't read this poem out loud to other human beings, so we'll see what it is. We'll see how we take it. It's definitely not, not a happy one, but it helps ground me, so I think that it fits. Uh, there's something really satisfying about holding a wooden pencil. I don't do it that often anymore. I used to, but it just feels real good. Right? Just think the same thing, Robert. All right. More loss. <laughs> Thank you. More loss isn't breaking me. Late for a friend's viewing. Frantic. Searching for sunglasses everywhere. I looked in my bag and their case and both cars and bathrooms. Laundry baskets, even the fridge. And the rush of rushing, the heat of uncertainty, made me sit down outside by the car to gather myself when I felt them teetering on my head, sort of dizzily gazing up at the powder blue sky. It felt like a reminder from you to stop being grim. So I took a breath and searched for a good feeling I must have deleted to save space. Something I felt days ago to pull me up because I needed to feel through a warm feeling before heading into a stuffy, cold funeral parlor to publicly pretend that more loss isn't breaking me. Around other people, I spend so much time pretending like at work where I counted nine times in the past two days when I casually spoke with colleagues about extreme weather pummeling our planet without once, men without once mentioning climate change. And the way the living pretend we aren't killing ourselves has, made, or has me discarding emotions to save space for hope. Poetic. That's the feeling I needed to find. The sense that poetry is a mouthpiece for the unrealized emotions I reach for when I don't know what I really need. I amble in, red-eyed, weary, and my sunglasses can't hide the poem of my face lined in tears. Who cares? It's a funeral, damn it. Time to grieve. And I'm brimming with hope because I'm still here to see the toxins we put in the sky make new hues, like that lavender tint I finally remembered seeing with you at the sunset last week before you decided to leave. Your favorite color. Hmm. Next up is Anna Cates, and please feel free to introduce the person, the person who's coming after you. I'd like to read three poems from my book, Electric Cat City. They fit the, the theme of grounded in a way. Song of the Venara. While memory still proffers, while faded parchments still offer hints, as old laments still haunt the hallows, each twilight slowly fading, Hear my song and know that I am in you. I hid in Himalayan heights, emerged from the depths, lingered in jungle shadows, passed from darkness into light. I am in you. As histories converge, I too am part of everything. Not as wild as you thought, bards wove me into melody. You joined me in cosmic harmony. See me again. 
I hid in Himalayan heights, emerged from the depths, lingered in jungle shadows, passed from darkness into light. I played my part. I am in you. Rawhide silhouette, serious burning down, the wolf's howl. And that poem was about prehistoric uh, demons. I forgot to mention that. And this poem is titled The Veil. Quote, there is no exquisite beauty without some strangeness in the proportion. Edgar Allan Poe. Concepts blur. Images ripple through the mind. Those depths fathomless and murky, tangled in seaweed, restless and beset by storms. At shadowy hours, rested ships ride virgin seas, waves scintillate with moonlight occultation. Beyond tide pools, gritty sand and grassy banks, grain shapes fields, fruit fills Eden, trees robe valleys and hills. In Merman's dreams, beyond the aqueous veil, Dry land goddesses waver in curious shapes. Maidens, wives, hags, peculiar stars, the daring enter as they are. Fallen stars blooming into pearls, thunder. And this last piece is titled Night Journey. Among the poppies we wandered far, till twilight hazed us all in dreams. We reached the brambles at morning's gleam, and stopped at forest's edge to try the fruit. The taste of sorrow, the tear of thorns, and now that silver time has cast me all in tears, I long to know, who was that golden soul I sojourned with? Why came we here, and did we set it all to right? If not, am I to blame, or was it fate, man's wretched plight? Strange apparitions forged from fog, illuminations. Thank you. Next up is Roger Fortin. Good evening. It's good to be here. Louder? Okay, I'll stand right here. How's that? Okay. Eat the mic. Okay, good. Well, I've never really been into poetry until about seven years ago when poems started coming to me at about 3 a.m. in the morning. And so uh, this first poem is called Very Early Morning. At 3 a.m., the veil is briefly lifted. The darkness is more penetrable. Being present is effortless, and breathing is audible. Ego and soul are friends here. Great peace abides. Now is the time to present questions to the oracle. Who in my dream is ringing the doorbell in the middle of the night? Why is the great lion commanding my attention? What is the sleek black panther seeking, facing me head to head? Messengers from the unconscious, waking me to a deeper life. The oracle speaks in the soul's silent language, and I realize that I'm being called to be fully present, to I as the observer and to you as the voice of the other. I step into the joy and pain. Your joy touches my joy, and your pain touches my pain. I keep my heart open and walk into the mystery. Together, we face the wild beasts. The oracle's message is clear. Keep your door open and allow the light to come in. Step into the soul of another and unceasingly listen 
to the wisdom of deep silence. The second one and last one is uh, Who We Become. And this is a second half of life poem. There is a point in our life when our goodbyes become more frequent than our hellos. When the walks we take to nowhere are more fulfilling than the walks we took to somewhere. When the weathered hands we hold feel more precious each day. There's a point in our life when our afflictions are doorways to our blessings. When the life we could have lived pales in comparison to the incredible life we have lived. When we recognize that the greatest gift we bring to humanity is our own inner peace. There is a point in our life when our love and our hate understand each other better. When we fully appreciate that the breath we take is the breath everyone takes. When even with all the storms we face, we know our caring and forgiving will always be our shared salvation. Thank you. Thank you, Roger. Please welcome Ed Davis. Thank you. Um, this last year I had the great good fortune to have five poems published in a magazine or a, an anthology called Alchemy of Miracles. You can probably find it online. But five poems in one shot. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> thank you. And uh, my friend Ann Randolph, who will speak shortly, is also in there with five poems. So very cool. So I thought I'd read ten poems. No, two. <laughs> um, I turned 70 a year before last. Time flies. I'll be 72 in four more days. So this is called 70th October, my favorite month. It has an epigraph. There is something in the autumn that is native to my blood. Bliss Carmen from A Vagabond Song. It's a long way if you're going slow. The path's the same, but dustier. We've been weeks without rain, and now it's October again. Too often I fly down these paths. I do not see these gleaming berries, these sun-clenched branches, having brought my studies' cares with me. My knees appreciate the slower pace. I cross ground softly, do not race. Fear of pain has me stepping slower, setting every foot down with love. Sun sends sympathizing light, declining since equinox. Like me, the canopy grows tired, leaves droop, some already fallen. All that grows declines and dies, but still shines one last time, even sings in its going. <laughs> There's mortality, but like Roger pointed out a while ago, you know, many joys. Uh, this one is, um, I guess, spawned by a recent visit to Hawking Hills called This Day. Down from old man's cave, we ascend sky steps of sculptured stone, a staircase spiraling up into the air over queers, queer creeks, low oboe furble. Deep pools mirror late spring green. Away from water, it's nearly silent. Hovering cliffs oversee the glen. Witness we mere mortals scrabbling up and down banks, squeezing between stones. One misstep could break bones. We behold a boulder gripped tight by tree roots, a woven world. Through a tunnel cut through rock, we sidestep, straddle, then splash, emerge into light, rebirth. These gifts, this time will never come again. 
this day and no other, this prayer and no other, for the world to recover, continue to thrive with or without us, abiding, enduring, alive. Thank you. Catherine Nimi Adams. I'm naturally quiet too, so. Okay, this is called My Time as Pluto. Do you if I can't see? There is no center to the universe, which does fight the logic formed in childhood lessons of there being this hot mass that the planets revolve around independency, regardless of having gravity and orbiting beings of their own. The symbiosis is uncomprehendingly beautiful and warm, so it's easy to forget that this is merely a solar system with an infinite within, the smallest inside in the nesting doll universe. I imagine if there were feelings involved, the planet could periodically shift in the discomfort of their own fixed state, and maybe one day just fall off their axis altogether and slip away anonymously into the expansion. And Randall. So if Ed brought his book, of course, I had to borrow it so I could read one of my poems, too. <laughs> I wasn't planning on it, but now I am. Um, okay, so the first poem is about Glenn Helen. It's called Special Delivery, Glenn Helen. She saunters along Birch Creek, escaping summer's heat, with the stream's faint tinkle swimming over rocks. Suddenly, an elegant lime green luna moth swoops onto the front of her flowered t-shirt. She gasps, stunned, rooted to ground. The creature's sleepy-looking eye spots arc in black, red, yellow, and white. In minutes, the moth lays a tiny mottled brown egg, then drops to earth, spent. The hiker's shirt now bears this mother's gift. Bending, she gently slides the body onto her palm, places it on green ground cover far from the path, promises to shelter the egg like her own. Home. She carefully removes her shirt, ties it under a tree branch, away from wind and rain. In a week, a larva will emerge, crawl away to feed, carrying her hope. Thank you very much. So the next poem was written um, during a trip to the Humboldt Redwood State Park in California, which is a fabulous place to visit. Um, and this is how it makes you feel. <laughs> Humboldt Redwood State Park, California. Like Lilliputians, we wander, insignificant as ants, among thousand-year giants, thick-muscled, blackened bark that fires cannot kill. Rust orange fissures split trunks like stretch marks, signal new growth. I step up to a massive trunk, place my ear to a small orange orifice. Hear high-pitched sounds like water rushing, wings beating, wind whistling. When I withdraw in awe, a blanket of quiet envelops me. Drawn to the opening again, like a bee to a cosmos flower, I close my eyes, bathed in the nectar of ancient voices. Thank you.
And next we have Valerie Bickett. Hi. This poem is called Triumph. My husband and I and three grown children have landed at the just barely an airport on the small Greek island of Carpathos. Four's the limit for the taxi, they tell us. So my daughter and I go first, and now, half an hour later, she and I are waiting for the boys, barely talking, sitting on a wall in an empty lot across the street from our little hotel, no one yet at the desk. Not even eight on a Sunday morning. The sun in the all-blue sky already hot. Stirrings in the houses, murmurings, doors closing, the smell of toast. The five of us with backpacks pulling suitcases all the way from our house in Ohio to this town on the Mediterranean. We watch a cat. I take some pictures I will end up losing before we leave. Up in the middle of the night in the placa, a long bus ride to the airport where we waited an hour at the gate with other people waiting to go to this place no one knows about. I have waited so long to go to and then an hour to get here and there it was out the window, the shape I knew from the maps a stretched out question mark, dots on both ends. The return, 80 years later, of the father's daughter to the father's birthplace. I don't do what I said I would do, kneel down and kiss the ground. Later, I tell myself, when no one is watching, I will, but I never do. Instead, a few days later, on the summer solstice, on the roof of the hotel, I face the four directions and do my little Tai Chi sequence, my own version, the one that takes me up into the greater good. Even if I have no rapturous feelings, even if it feels like I'm manufacturing the experience, even if I just go downstairs later and make too big of a supper, for the little kitchenette and we eat and fuss and go to bed like we do at home. Later, afraid to drive to any height without guard without guardrails, I bail on my family and walk by myself across the ridge line, my feet sore in my new shoes, only to be surprised on the way back by a grandmother who comes out of the woodwork to give me apricots from her apron like I was passing royalty. She sees me, must see my father's ashes that I myself forgot were in my backpack, returning the father to the father's birthplace. And what did I do but thank her, have stole, and keep going like I had to be somewhere? No time for all nine yards. But of course, there was time. I could have easily thrown myself down, spread eagle on the runway, and closed my eyes. At the airport, in a peri, around the field chapel where we spread the ashes, or at the feet of the good mother, who, as it turned out, brought the ground to me, lifted the host to my lips, offered the breast that had been ripped out, not only of my father's mouth, but my own. Next up, Barbara Roar. Followed by Dave Garrison, Robert Pachel. Abigail Cobb, Suzanne Garrison, Karen Scott, and Nicole Waldron. Can you hear me? Okay. 
Um, I have been struggling of late, and a friend called to check on me. I said I was crying earlier when I need to be putting away my outdoor furniture. I have guys coming in a little bit to clean the deck. So what am I doing? I'm sitting here writing a poem. And my friend said, that sounds about right. So we both agreed when we are overwhelmed or hurt, we would all do well to sit and write a poem. This is what I wrote that day. It's called Morning Prayer Interruption. I saw the tail first, thought it was a squirrel, until on the opposite branch strode a young raccoon, babies venturing out as if called forth by the safety of prayer. My dog Rosie barked, not at the young ones, whom she hadn't noticed, but at a delivery truck on the street. The raccoons took notice, retreated to the hollow slit further up where no doubt they were born. I went on with my prayer, adding that young ones everywhere have a safe place to retreat while a big dog keeps danger away. Dave Garrison. Hi, I just, I'm going to read one poem, and I just picked it out kind of at random, but I realized it has something to do with an artificial solstice. Uh, when I was finishing my PhD, I used to close down the library and walk home through a rather dangerous district of, uh, of Baltimore, and uh, the crime was such a problem that uh, they had these really serious high crime lights that were so bright that the trees thought it was spring and started sprouting. So that, that was the uh, solstice I went through there. But anyway, and that's just part of the poem. The poem is called My Masseuse Speaks Out Against Violence. And this is the masseuse speaking to me. This is lavender oil. You like the smell? And the music is my favorite, Stardust Transcendence. Let me know if you're cold and I'll add a blanket. And just holler if I press too hard, I don't want to hurt you. You've got a big knot in your neck, so relax while I work you over. How does that feel? Better? Sorry for the long drive out here. I had to move out of my place downtown because the anti-crime lights kept me awake. I own a gun and wouldn't hesitate to use it. No, sir, if somebody breaks in here, I waste him. Roll over now and I'll get your back. As the base of your spine sore, it feels tight. They say you do the crime, you do the time, and anyone who messes with me will do eternity. I shoot to kill. I keep my pistol loaded right here under the table. You're lying on. Whoa, boy. This muscle has gone into spasm. Hold on while I rub you out. I know that poem. Robert Paschal. I, I am with it, and I am not with it. 
Uh, it's uh, very uplifting and humbling to be here. Uh, there is a throbbing fluidity to the movement of a small flock of birds as they sweep down from tree to ground and when danger threatens are swept back up again to branch and bow as if a net were being hauled up and each knot tied was the tag team body of a bird. And when they alight on ground again, it's like liquid chain mail poured from the picture of the sky with one or two loose couplings and frizzy ends. The birds have got their buddy system down all right, and it's the flock that can lift off of a field like a tarp plucked up by the wind, like a life mask of form and contour peeled off the ground, like an undulating hand lifting from the earth. Now, I'm not, I'm not real solid on these. Let's see. Thank you. As day slips into evening's depths, the sun sings like a humpbacked whale. Long gray, low lying clouds are its flippers, its tail is the motion of stars. A cloud's a hoodie for the sky. A tree is a straw that drinks up rain, bursts into leafy bloom on high, or sheds or shaves our heads in time of drought, breathes in and out, and passes water round again. One, one more short one. Uh, this is after the owl and the pussycat went to see a beautiful pea green boat. They took lots of honey and plenty of money wrapped up in a 10 pound milk. A vowel and a copycat went to press with a box of kitty alliteration to clean up the mess. <laughs> but everything went swimmingly by the grace of their M-E-W-S muses because <laughs> they minded their pea green peas with a cumin in the course of their crews. One more short one. I'll see. I, I'll see if my memory serves here. The round-faced pillbox bug cradles a pewter teapot, wears a lustrous gray fringe shawl. Venerable grandmother, mustached, hunchbacked babushka, bustling about in the leaf litter, carrying her birch bass barket, basket to market, mulling over the price of potatoes and cabbages as the full moon rises like an emperor moth by the oversized wings looking for a place to land. Lots of starlings this evening. I just want to remind everyone as a member of the Board of Trustees for a person of interest. That's an invasion of species, right? Like they don't even belong here. They were actually introduced, I think, by the Shakespearean Society in Boston. Right? Like, yeah, it's so pretty. 
Whoops. Uh, anyway, oh, all apologies. Abigail Cobb. Uh, this is uh, Autumn Poem 2023, also called Tikkun Olam, which is a Hebrew phrase meaning, among other things, to repair the world. It is in the softness I feel it, in the clear light of a late autumn afternoon, sweet sunshine flooding the hillside, unobstructed by bare branches. Or on a damp autumn evening, twilight mist softly shadowing dark trees before the moon is up, I feel it, a presence of calm, of quiet, touching me in gently moving tides of well-being, telling me that all will be well, is well, and that the only path forward through hell is seeing beauty everywhere, in everything, even in ugliness, and speaking kindly from a forgiving heart, the infinitesimal steps to save the world. Susan Bears. Thank you. This will be brief and painful. Uh, painless, painless, painless. <laughs> and uh, it's uh, it's about a solstice visitor that we have every year. And I didn't know Matt's theme, but this is, uh, in, in a sense, about grounding. Um, because I grew up kind of in the, the high tide of the Middle Ages. I had a lot of relatives that were nuns and priests and monks and the like. And we were taught to be able to spot them by their the colors of their habits, you know, so you could tell a Cistercian from a, uh, you know, a Franciscan and the like. Uh, but this is not about them, but about uh, how it be imagined or I imagined it. Uh, uh, the joke in my family was, that, you know, the the, uh, the Jesuits are like the American League and the, um, you know, the uh, <laughs> who teaches at at UD. The uh, Marianists are like the National League, you know. That so it was that kind of separation and learning to. Uh, but this is called, anyway, this is called Church Mouse. We heard him first on the Feast of St. Nicholas, a mouse, celibate, we hoped, who made a monastic cell in the insulation behind the wall in the kitchen. While he quietly worshipped us as unseen gods, providers of warmth and food and solitude, we began to doubt his existence. But soon there were scratches there were scratched messages like Saxon runes and the Christmas candle wax from this scurrying little scribe. I imagined him a fat Dominican, black-backed, white-bellied, fan of Aquinas. My husband saw him as a brown Fran Franciscan field mouse. We could have let such a scholar stay for the winter to ponder the number of dancing angels on a grain of sugar. We might have shared our crumbs and what we knew of life. But his theology turned suddenly scatological. <laughs> we had no choice. A regular monk Luther on the pot, dropping evidence of his angst in the silverware drawer. In the snapping trap of a counter-reformation, we excommunicated him. <laughs> <laughs> Scatological. Scatological, it's not a good evening unless you've heard the word scatological. Karen, follow that. I was just thinking that if it was in my house, that would be a very shorter poem because I... <laughs> I have a cat who's a certified mouser. He's got at least six kills to his to his uh, fame. So, 
Anyway, I'm going to turn serious for a minute. Um, usually when we have gatherings of poets, it tends to be poet is me to poet. My question is, and I can see by a show of hands, how many of you are members of the High Poetry Association? All right. Those people with your hands down, please consider joining. Um, not only do you get membership in the Ohio Poetry Association, but you also become a member automatically of the National Federation of State Poetry Society. Say that quickly. And you just need to go to our website, ohiopoetryafsn.org, and you can do your membership right there. And I'm going to do one poem. My muse, as usual, would be quite fickle. So I didn't get anything written for grounding, so I pulled out a poem, and it's pretty old, but the closest thing to grounding. Roots and wings. Give them roots and give them wings. That's what parents are supposed to do. It's never as easy as it sounds. Because when she leaves, I miss not only my daughter, but my best friend, too. Give them roots and give them wings. I guess it's a testament to a job well done when your child tells you she's not moving home. But I'm human and selfish. I want her home with me, so I won't be alone. Give them roots and give them wings. When she talks of Boulder, Portland, New York, I die a little inside. To have her so far away, I dread the thought. Give them roots and give them wings. For all the dread of her leaving me, I want her to fly to grow, to experience her own life, to make her own way. I've given her roots a safe place to launch from. I've given her wings, maybe always bring her home, because this girl is going to stretch her wings and fly. Thank you. And next we have Nicole Waldry. What a lovely evening. I really appreciate the invite, my friend gave me to come here. Uh, and then after most of the poets, I went, please don't let me be next. Please don't let me be next. <laughs> uh, it's, it's been really lovely. Um, I think you mentioned the generational thing, reading on the phone. I'm actually reading a picture of my notebook because I didn't bring anything with me. So this is the intergenerational move here. <laughs> um, my Stepmother is from New Orleans, and I visited uh, shortly after Katrina, and this was my letter to the city after, uh, after that visit. Sweetheart, you're falling apart. You're becoming the hummed rendition of a song that has lo been long lost. From your mounds of crumbled co concrete to your displaced bricks, people are starting to forget who you were. Graffiti tattoos and doorways that reek of urine and booze. Baby girl, your past was reckless. Neighbors can't greet each other through barbed wire fences, and your rusty rail ties lead to more danger signs than depots. What happened that you never sobered up? The milk is sour and the bread is stale. You've got to want to get yourself together, because, my dear, you're dying. Once your fire goes out and your lights go dim, you'll be discarded like those bottles in your streets existing as a fleeting memory in the minds of the decrepit. Pitiful little mistress, only you can save you now. Tell me, do you even remember who you are? Okay. I wish I could have you guys with the mouse situation, because that was good. This one's called The Blues. She has every right to sing the blues. She assumes the singer's stance, sequined from mid-thigh slits, a cleavage, misery crafted into a pretty thing. A room full of indebted pockets and heavy hearts want to be entertained. The audience anticipated a voyeuristic date, all eyes to stage, toward the shimmering black dress and gleam on the saxophone. A marriage to make the old loneliest duet. They invite the toe taps and finger snaps and the room falls into a hypnotic sort of sway. They feel good despite the suffering in the song. The snare whispers secrets like gossip told over shoulders as if everyone didn't already know that she has every right to sing the blues. The lyrics have a way of sliding down the neck and wreaking havoc on the heart, inciting feelings these poor souls don't know to regret yet. 
The trombone resonates. Pulse rate is dictated by the upright bass. Heads gnaw, nod in awe and approval as the sounds of each solo soar into the rafters. She sings her heart out because she has every right to sing the blues. Thanks. That's it. Thank you so much. Thanks, everyone.